Okay, we're starting. Let's see. Okay, so we're starting the class. Uh, a few things before. First of all, the t-shirt. Because every time I put on this t-shirt or some t-shirt, everybody asks me. So, long story short, my wife bought me these t-shirts and said to wear them. And as I explained to everyone, that's why I'm still married. I'm not really still very comfortable in them yet, but working on it. It's not easy I'm and um, <clears throat> updates on the war. So I was telling Arya before that I was sick earlier this week, Babu Hashim, with a nice stomach virus tikkun. Now the tikkun is over, so I'm very grateful. And uh, while I was laying in bed, I had this idea, I was watching debates on Israeli TV, on YouTube, and I had this idea to translate a very important conversation from a retired General um, Yitzhak Brik, who probably most English speakers have never even heard of the guy, but his job for the last 10 years, he just retired, was to um, give reports on the army's readiness for war. And he ripped into the army and he wrote reports, and he was very vocal, and um, <clears throat> he had plenty of exposure, and he met with Netanyahu, and he met with the chiefs of staff, and he met with all the generals, and he predicted this war, and nobody listened to him. It's only, it was only after the massacre on uh, October 7th that I even heard of him, because he started showing up in my YouTube feed. And um, he explained, long story short, the reason that we're not going into Gaza. I hope that's the reason. He explained the reason why we shouldn't be going into Gaza right now. Um, he said that it's simply a trap. That if we think that Hamas was prepared for jumping over a fence that cost how much money? 10 billion shekels or something crazy like that. Then he said, wait till you see what they have waiting for our soldiers in Gaza. So he said, we need to place a siege on Gaza. And a siege is a type of warfare, as we know in the Torah and through all of uh, recorded history, it is a known way of uh, killing your enemy. For anyone that has any questions about how effective sieges are, just look up 
Hey there! Hey guys! Welcome. The Battle of Stalingrad. I'm talking about sieges. And uh, the, just to give a, um, we'll get to the lesson in just a second. I'm just giving a little update on what's going on. Uh, the Battle of Stalingrad. So, and I got to really make this short. Um, Stalin and Hitler, you know, had a pact that they wouldn't attack one another, and Hitler attacked Stalin. And Stalin could not believe it. And what city did Hitler take over? Stalingrad. Sent 250, 400,000 Nazi soldiers to take over Stalingrad. There's nothing that could piss off Stalin more than taking over the city under his name. So after losing a bunch of Soviet soldiers, he realized it's very simple. We're just going to surround Stalingrad and starve out the, the, the Nazis. It took six months, 250,000 of them simply starved to death. That's it. End of Stalingrad. And that's what this General Brick is saying we have to do with the northern part of Gaza. We have to cut it off and wait six months. So we'll attack every night. We'll destroy everything in Gaza, but don't send a single soldier in. So if anybody wants to know why it's not happening, that's at least the military reason why it's not happening. And most likely the reason that's really not happening is because Netanyahu is a great politician and a terrible leader, I'm sorry to say. And he's not able to make decisions because he's worried, will it affect my political future? And for anybody who thinks he doesn't have one, they've said that about him a million times in the past, and he always outsmarted everyone. But that's what's going on right now. So I just wanted to give a quick update on that because, you know, we're sitting here in tense times and it can be confusing what's going on. What's going on? No, I was, I was listening. Oh, you're welcome to listen. You're welcome to come and listen. Okay, you can listen wherever you want. Um, <clears throat> so that was it. I just wanted to give an explanation. And, and I was telling you that I translated. I had a stomach virus earlier this week. So when I was in bed, I was translating this um, conversation with this general who wrote about all, who spoke about all this. Okay, so now back to the lesson. Um, at, at the request of somebody who watches the class, we're dedicating this class to the Loi Nishmat of Fayel ben Yosef and to the Loi Nishmat, Nish, I don't know how you say it even, Nishamot of all the people that were murdered leading up in, into this, in this war, up to this war, and Bezat Hashem, in the merit of our learning tonight, <clears throat> the army should be successful, um, the kidnapped people should be returned, and all the families of the people who lost loved ones should be comforted, Bezat Hashem. And the unity that the Jewish people have should continue also after the war. Okay, so we're learning from Torah Aleph in the Kutay Mohan, which is the first lesson in the Kutay Mohan, and we just got started a couple of weeks ago. And it starts out by saying that it's through Torah and davening that basically everything comes to a person. Everything comes to a Jew, through Torah and davening. And he says, Torah and davening are chen v'chashivut. That's what he calls it. Grace and importance. And he says the grace and importance of the Jewish people that should be for the Jewish people have been given to the nations of the world. So you just see it simply in the United Nations or in the media or in the world in general. Why, is, why are the Jewish people not on the level of China? A superpower like China and the United States? He says, because... The chen v'chashivut was given to the goyim. How do the Jews get the chen and chashivut back, the grace and importance back? They get it through davening, and they get it through Torah. I guess I'm still hot. It's not cold enough for me outside. Get it through davening and through Torah. And then, as Rabbi Nachman likes to build his lessons, he um, takes this chen chashivut, breaks it down. We go to many different levels. And what we reached last week is he says, Isha Yisraeli. So this is a term that Rabbi Nachman uses throughout the Kutei Moran. And somebody who is a Zionist and understands Hebrew and reads this is like, oh, wow, Rabbi Nachman was a Zionist. I'm guessing I've never seen anything Zionistic about Rabbi Nachman's teachings. He was definitely pro Eretz Yisrael, like a lot of the Haredim, but not pro Zionist. Um, I, I would say he was probably anti-Zionist. It would make sense that he was. We could, that, now I'll start a whole lecture about that, so I'm not going any deeper into that. 
Um, but when he says, so we learned last week when he says, Isha Yisraeli, why does he use that word? Because Yisrael is, if you take the letters and rearrange them, Li Rosh. I have a brain, I have a head. And he's saying, when you act as a person who uses their brain, you're an Ish HaYisraeli. And he says, and this is a famous phrase from the Kotei Moran, Ki Ish HaYisraeli tzarich tamid listeken basechem shem bechol davar. The person, the Jewish person, but really the person who's using their intellect, has to look at the wisdom within everything. And he says, everything has within it wisdom. He says, in the physical world we know this, and I gave the analogy of the pick, or a light bulb, or any physical object that you see. I mean, for sure, this uh, electronic remote, there's so much chokhmah that went into this on every level that you, you can just understand the concept that he's trying to say, that there's wisdom in everything by looking at something like this. You know, how did somebody figure out the, the wave and the buttons and the plastic and the print and the digital clock and everything that runs it inside? And you could go on even a simpler level, just a piece of paper. How did somebody come up with making paper? So he says, okay, we look at the physical world and we see there's chokhmah, there's intelligence and there's wisdom in every physical object, so all the more so in spiritual things. And he says, so when you look at your life, there is meaning in everything that happens in your life. And if you're on a high enough level, you're going to perceive it. That would probably only be the level of somebody like Rabbi Nachman, the Baba Cherebi, the Baal Shem Tov, I don't know who in the Litvak world is on that level, but um, who was uh, Rabbi Kanievsky who passed away was probably on that level. And these are people that are really high level tzaddikim. What makes a tzaddik so perceptive they don't, it's kind of like the Matrix, if you remember the movie. What was so special about the Keanu Reeves character is that he was able to be, see beyond the Matrix. Beyond what seemed like this, uh, this fantasy world, he could see what was beyond that. And the Tzaddikim can see beyond it as well. People that are not Tzaddikim, that try to think or, or perceive things as Tzaddikim, usually end up being fools and just saying stupid things. And there's plenty of those people in the Chlaot. I know some personally. <laughs> and so he's, this, it's a very interesting thing that we've come across this many times in the Kutema One. The Rabbi Nachman says, look for the meaning in the things that happen in your life. But he kind of gives a warning. He says, if you look and you're not really looking, you're gonna find the wrong thing and misunderstand it. So you know, like somebody, I, I, whenever people say things like, you know, the Shoah happened because Jews in Germany were, were assimilating and marrying non-Jews. So, of course, that's why six million Jews were murdered. But they forget how many Rebbe's and Tzadikim were murdered at the same time. So, what? Their, their mitzvot are worth less than the transgressions of those Jews? So you can't explain it. It doesn't make sense. And so when people say, well, I understand why, you know, my car broke down, it's because I said something bad to my friend six months ago and I didn't apologize to them. What Rabbi Nachman is saying is that's a bunch of baloney, that's nonsense, that's not the way that you interpret this. And, and people do that, right? Everybody knows that and, and it's a natural thing. We all want to understand, you know. I'm sure people are trying to say what happened in the South it was because they're all a bunch of leftists or something stupid like that. Uh, they supported Hamas, so I don't know, people say stupid things. It, mm -hmm. The point is that that's not what he's saying. It's a very delicate message that you have to hear, but you have to have such quiet in your mind and be so open to hearing what Hashem has to say that you don't put the words into it, Hashem puts the words into you. In a way, I have a story in my one day upcoming book. I did get two more chapters done last week. I'm close, I only have like 60 pages left to edit, and then I can finally move it along. I have a beautiful story there about this, um, I don't know what we call it today, mentally handicapped. When I was growing up, we called people like that retarded, whatever they're called today, mentally challenged, I don't know. Uh, he called himself a savant. 
So you know a savant is somebody who really has some mental problem and they're capable of super focusing on one thing. And what was this guy's capability? Music. He could hear harmonies. And the guy that was the chazin for Rosh Hashanah hired this guy, this mentally uh, handicapped guy to sing harmony. And I like to sit in the front of the shul. I don't leave the davening on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. And I like to sing harmony. Like that's what I do. Oh, the gate locked. <coughs> oh, that's why you went around because the gate was locked. No, I didn't think oh, that okay. was time. No. Okay, so you can come in next time from the gate there. Cool. All right, there's a rock there. If you want to put it. Yeah, I'll keep moving. You see on top? Yeah, it's open. Ah, Moshe, welcome. Oh. Come on in. We're just talking about singing harmony. <clears throat> it's right up your alley. Yeah. So this guy was singing these beautiful harmonies, and I said to him afterwards, how do you hear these harmonies? He's like, what do you mean? You just quiet your mind and listen, and you'll hear them. So I started, then I didn't see him again. And after that, I started really like quieting my mind and listening for harmonies to come into my head. And all of a sudden, I heard new harmonies that I never heard before. And then I realized this is a lesson in life. Like if you can quiet your mind, you can hear things in a positive way, not in a crazy way, that can give you some guidance. And so that's what we're learning here in this lesson at this stage. So he says, this thing of looking for wisdom in everything, Zeb Chinat Yaakov. This is connected to Yaakov. Now he's going to talk, I don't think this week we're going to get to Esav. He's going to talk about Yaakov and Esav, which of course you know are the two brothers, they're the sons of Yitzchak and um, I always get Rivka. I always get Rachel and Rivka even then. You're Leah, Sarah, but Rachel. Leah, Rachel, but Sarah. There you go. I know you told me it's like the, all the, the forefathers and the mothers together. So the two brothers were complete opposites, and you know that the, we know the story, it's coming up soon that um, Esau comes back, he's hungry. He says to Yaakov, give me some of that stew. Yaakov says, sell me your birthright. He says, what's my birthright worth? And that was the story I told last week also. What's my birthright worth? Here you go. And he sells it to him. And then he becomes the Bechor, becomes the firstborn. So now Rabbi Nachman's going to go in his uh, poetic way and break all that down. The Chochmah Zebchinat Yaakov. Wisdom is connected to Yaakov. Ki Yaakov Gazo. Because Yaakov merited this level. That he looked at the wisdom within everything. And he was able to look at everything until there was a light that showed him the way and everything in his life. And this vision that Yaakov merited to see. And it was through this that Yaakov merited to become the firstborn, to, to buy the right for the firstborn. Now you realize the two of them were born only seconds apart. So it wasn't like he was five years younger and he's buying the firstborn, but maybe in halacha that's how it works. So it was through his wisdom that he was able to do the shekana ota me'esav, that he bought it from Esav. Sha bechora u reshit. So the, the bechora, the firstborn, is called reshit, which is first. And, and first, I'll just make the connections as we're going. First is the Torah. Reshit is, is also the Torah. So what he's saying is that through his wisdom, he bought this level of being the Bechor. And through that, he used his wisdom to connect to the Torah. Bechor is the firstborn of the sons. Reshit is the and Reshit is connected to Chokhmah, it's connected to wisdom. Kamosha Ketuv, as it's written, Reshit Chokhmah. So he's getting a text proof. Saying, I'm, I'm not just pulling this out of the air. Here it is in Tehillim, it says, Reshit Chokhmah, meaning Reshit is Chokhmah. First is wisdom. Shereya Chokhmah, Nikreit Reshit, Vadechora, I Reshit, Umemele, I Bechinat Chokhmah. He's saying, here's all the connections here. Chochmah is called Reshit, and the firstborn is called Reshit, so automatically that means it's connected to Chochmah. 
ומכיוון שיעקב זכה לבכורה, since Yaakov merited to become the firstborn, שהרי זכה לבחינת חוכמה, that he merited this through his wisdom, זה בחינת הכתוב שאמר עשיו על יעקב, this is connected to what עשיו said about יעקב, שנטל ממנו את הבכורה והברכות, when יעקב took away from עשיו the firstborn and the blessings, הכי קרא שמו יעקב. Isn't he called יעקב? כי יעקבני זה פעמיים. Because he, and we're going to explain what is יעקבני, he outsmarted me is what it means, twice. ותאוגום אונקולס, and how does אונקולס translate this? And we know that אונקולס was a convert and translated the Torah into Aramit, Aramaic, which was basically for us the English of the day. But through his translation, he also gave a, a commentary. So how does Unkulus trans, translate Yakveni? Um, Chakmeni. He outsmarted me. So now Rabbi Nachman is saying, you see, Yaakov is connected to Chochman, even Unkulus agrees with me. The Hainu, she Esav Tama, let's say that Esav was surprised. Is this the reason that my brother is called Yaakov? על שם חוכמתו, because he's so smart, שהיה חכם ממני פעמיים, two times he was smarter than me, ולקח ממני גם את הבכורה וגם את הברכות, that he took from me the firstborn, the, the level of being the firstborn, and also the blessings from our father, הרי שיעקב נקרא בשם יעקב על שם חוכמתו. So now Rabbi Nachman is saying, yep, that is the reason that, the, that his parents gave him the name Yaakov, because they had, I guess, some prophecy that they knew that he was going to be wise, and the meaning of Yaakov is wisdom. Now, all of this is going to come back. This is just how Rabbi Nachman builds the lessons. He's going to come back to say, how does this being connected to Yaakov help us to see the meaning and everything in our lives? And the wisdom and the knowledge that there is in everything, zebechinat shemesh. This is connected to the sun, so now he's giving us another text proof. Ki asechen, hu meir lo la'adam b'chon derachab b'ruchniut. The intellect lights up for a person all of their all of their paths on a spiritual level. Now we understand that, right? When you don't understand something, you don't have the light. You do understand something, you have the light. We have now a term called enlightened. That would be somebody who was like in the darkness, now they're enlightened. We have woke, which is even beyond enlightened. And just... Mitushkal or Mitaru or Mitaru? I don't know what that's Mit... What? Like, it, like woke, how would you say in Hebrew? Oh, woke. Mirurar, <clears throat> um, maybe? I don't know. So, you know, in the cartoons when we were kids, the light bulb goes off when the person gets it. So that's what he's trying to say, that when you grasp the concept intellectually, the light goes off. And that's connected to Shemesh. And the Shemesh, the sun, is the ultimate light. Just like this, the sun can show for a person. Wow, yeah, yeah. Sorry. welcome. Sorry about the light. It's okay. What did you bring? I brought Eitan. Eitan, welcome. Welcome, Barak. Well, you know, yeah, El, this is Leah, Aryeh, and Moshe. Welcome. Oh, and I, didn't say, I didn't even say hi to everybody who's watching. To Mate Esther, Zahava, David, Chaya, and Matthew, and my mother, of course, who watches. She's now on a transatlantic cruise coming back from London to Miami. I don't know, I think it's two weeks or something like that on the boat. She should have safe travels as the ship. Okay, so we're learning, we're learning from this, the Kutay Moanas in one. I'm going to summarize it in like two sentences. He says, all of the blessings, everything that a person wants, comes through either davening or Torah, or both of them together, more likely both of them together. And the first that's the first concept that he puts out there. And he says, and there's wisdom in everything. And for a person to be able to see the wisdom, they have to use the wisdom of Yaakov. And now he's bringing a bunch of text proofs to show us that Yaakov means wisdom, Yaakveni 
Chakveni uh, is where we are right now, that Yaakveni is what Esau said about Yaakov, that he outsmarted me, and Unkulo says that means that he was smarter than me. And now we're talking about the, the idea that when you understand something, it's like the light going off in your head. And that's what he says, the sun. Just like the sun, when it's daytime and it's not cloudy, it shows us the way where we need to go, like at night, if we didn't have lights in the street. And you were that, saying the light goes on when we walked in and the light went on. Ah, and that's good, the so, light. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I should have said when Mashiach comes. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. yon. And so now you're saying, we have this light that goes off in our head <clears throat> when we intellectually mm-hmm. understand something. <clears throat> and on a spiritual level, in the supernal realms, the root of, of Chochmah and Shemesh, of wisdom and the sun, Hein B'china Achat. They're coming from the same place. So you, there, Rabbi Nachman talks a lot about these um, Shoresh Shekom Dabar. Everything has a root up above. So we understand that like, the, the hairs that we have in our body, they all have roots. They're all connected to something. We have, we have a very long hair. It could be all the way over here. And we would never think that it's connected to that root that's over here. And he says, same thing on a spiritual level. All these things that happen in this world, they're all connected on the spiritual level. One of the lessons that we learned was anger and money. And he says that anger and money are from the same root. So when something happens, like somebody bumps into you really hard in the street, and uh, this actually happened to me, and I did get angry, so I probably gave away a lot of money when I did that. <laughs> it was yesterday, one of the Walt, uh, you know, Walt, Walt, Walt not Walt, yeah. Six. One of the Walt guys, I was crossing a grip bus, he practically ran me over. Wow. So I grabbed his bag and stopped him, and he was angry. <laughs> and then he was a little shorter than me. And and he I think he looked at my white beard, and he's like, never mind, I'm just going to leave this guy alone. Okay, so the point being that anger and money come from the same root. That was what I wanted to say. And he says that so when a person gets angry, when they're tested like that, and they don't get angry, and they're able to stay calm, then it allows Hashem to send money to the person. But should a person get angry, then they give up on the money. And you think, well, that's not fair. But that's how Hashem created the world, according to Rabbi Nachman. And they're from the same root. So now he's saying that light, the light of the sun, and wisdom are also from the same root. So when you have this light that goes off in your head, it's coming from wisdom, and it's also coming from the same place as the light of the sun. Now he's giving a, a text proof to prove this from Mishlei. Noga. Noga, my wife, yeah. And the light of the tzadikim is like a bright light, that's what Noga means, and it gets stronger and stronger until midday. What is the way of the tzadikim? It's to bring light, right? Anybody who's a true tzadik, um, <clears throat> tzadikit, their path is to, lead, is to bring light. And anybody who like takes themselves very, very seriously and is very dark and depressed and, and you're around this person and they're you just feel down, even if the whole world is saying they're a tzaddik, unless they're a really, really hidden tzaddik, probably not a tzaddik. People that went in front of the Lavish Rebbe, for example, I had this experience, with a huge light coming out of him. There are people, uh, there's at least one woman here in the neighborhood, I'm going to tell you who she is, Sarah, who lives here on Shiloh Street. She picks up all the food from the shuk and distributes it. I guarantee you this woman is a tzaddikit. She should have a long and healthy life. And when the day comes that she passes away, thousands of people are going to come with stories. And you're going to, everyone's going to realize that she was like this huge light. And you see her. She's, the, she's a light. You see her in the shuk. She's always happy. There's something positive about her. That's the way of tzaddikim. <clears throat> Whenever a woman asks me, well, who do I go to for a bracha? I send them to Sarah. I also send all of my girls to volunteer with her. Just like the, the light of the sun. When it comes up, yeah, I'm doing the sun coming up in the screen here. It comes up, you just see a little bit of the sun, and it gets brighter and brighter and brighter. That's the way of the tzaddikim. Um, <clears throat> where are we? Ve'olechu mitgaber ad chatzot hayom. Get stronger until midday, she'az ha'o 
who bechazko u gvuato, and then the light is in its highest level. Umevo arusha derech la sigeta o a sechel al yedeit bonenut basechem shekol devar. And the way that a person is able to see the wisdom within everything and to meditate on the wisdom with everything, ki ma'at ma'at. It's a tiny, tiny bit. <clears throat> this is really important. He's giving the example of the sun. He's saying the sun doesn't just pop up in the morning and just boom, all the sun comes up very, very, very slowly. And when you try to understand what's happening in your life, and why is Hashem doing this, and why is Hashem doing that, if you think, boom, you got it, that's not how it works. It goes very, very, very slowly, and you have to be very gentle in your listening and not force anything. Because if you start forcing something, you'll misinterpret what Hashem is saying to you. <clears throat> this is, I think this is such a difficult thing that I, I would have warned Rabbi Nachman not to put it in the Kutim Oman. But it shows up in many places that he talks about how you can see the wisdom in everything. Because people will misunderstand it. They'll say, why did I end, I was talking about it at the beginning, you know, why did I end up missing that bus? Oh, it was because I offended my friend. You don't know that. We, we don't know those things. I gave the example of the Holocaust, or <clears throat> people say it's because of assimilation, but what about all the tzaddikim that died in the Holocaust? So when you start jumping to those types of conclusions, you're going to make a mistake. And that's why it's kind of dangerous what he's saying. But it's there. Because anybody who gets to this point, and he's... And I Yosef, Yosef did, did that at the end of this story. He yeah. says to his brothers, don't worry, Hashem organized it. Because he saw, he understood. He but he was a tzaddi. <clears throat> yeah, he was on a very high spiritual level, but he's talking to us. Rabbi Nachman is not talking to somebody at the level of Yosef. So are you that saying, it can be done, I'm, I know it can be done. Are you saying a person never should try to... Even if you look at some process and you see, ah, because I did this, then I ended up doing that, and then I, you see the steps. No, I'm not saying never. I'm, I'm saying the concept that Rabbi Nachman is bringing is there's wisdom in everything. And you can see that wisdom. But in, the, in our day and age, when we have all of the psychology and Tony Robbins and who knows all the methods and stuff out there, everybody wants to just know, like, what, what is the meaning of this? Why am I still in this situation? Whatever, the whole, give the whole list. And then you can come up with all kinds of meanings. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying that there is kind of like a very gentle message that Hashem is giving you all the time. <clears throat> you have to learn to be sensitive enough to hear it. Like <clears throat> um, people used to be able to put their ear on a train track and, and hear the vibration from a distance. And I think the better a person's hearing and sensitivity was to hearing the train, the further away they could hear the train from. It's that type of thing. But if a person doesn't have that sensitivity and remove their ego at the same time, like not try to force what Hashem is saying, they'll make a mistake. And, and then they'll say, well, I, I listened to Barak's class, and he said, Rabbi Nachman said, and I understand now everything in my life, why the dog bit me, and why the fish jumped out of the bowl, and why everything happened. That's not the point, and that's why I say it's dangerous for Rabbi Nachman to mention this. So I'm just giving this warning, that you have to be very, very, very careful. What he's going to say, if I stop explaining everything and actually get to it, <clears throat> Joe won't today, so I'm just going to tell you what he says. He says, what is the secret behind hearing what Hashem has to say? It's emunah. What does that mean, emunah? Emunah means that you don't think that you know how to make things work. You're allowing Hashem to tell you how things are going to work. So, <clears throat> um, let's, let, you know, there are all these stories coming out about from the people that survived the massacre in the South. At least the first, I would say, two weeks. I, I don't know if I've heard these stories lately. Every time I would watch something on either Channel 12 or Channel 14, they always were bringing up stories of people that, like this policewoman, this incredible policewoman in Sterot. This woman was like Rambo times 10. And she's just sitting there. She's even missing some fingers after the whole thing. And she's sitting there calmly explaining how she shot this terrorist and shot that terrorist and this one and that one. <coughs> <coughs> I 
Now, what did I want to say? All right, so now, in order to do that, you have to have a certain level of emuna. And this woman had emuna, whether she knew it or not. She didn't sit there when the Sderot police station was under attack by 50 or 100 or who knows how many Hamas terrorists and say, okay, let's make a plan. We're going to have to seal that window and we're going to have to station these people here. She didn't have time for that. It was just like, what are we going to do at this moment? And she was tuned in to what Hashem was telling her to do. And she intuited it and she did it. <clears throat> yeah, but I want to talk about normal people. Pinchas is, a, I know you're, you're a, a scholar of biblical figures, so it comes to mind. But I like to bring things down to like our level. So this woman, who's not religious, she was able to hear what she's supposed to do because she had a muna. Even if she didn't even realize it, she had a muna. We can purposely have a muna. We can say, okay, right now I'm in a situation that I can't handle, so I'm going to stop trying to figure out how to handle it until I figure out, until Hashem sends me an idea. And in order to do that, you have to clear your mind, and you have to daven, and you have to lean on Hashem. And when you do that, Hashem will send you ideas in your head. And maybe the first few won't be the right ones, but you'll get to the right one. That's, do you understand the difference I'm trying to say? One is, I'm, I'm not even tapping into that at all. I'm not interested in what Hashem has to say to me. I know what I have to do, and I'm just doing it. And the other is saying, I'm not even going to pretend like I know what to do. I'm going to wait for Hashem to tell me what I need to do. And when I see it, it'll be clear to me. Those are the two different paths. And that's what he's saying. That's the ultimate level that a person has to get. The, the tzaddikim are on the highest level of Amuna. They're completely connected to Hashem like <clears throat> a string. Now I thought, I couldn't figure out what story I was going to tell tonight. Now I know the story. I tell the story of um, Rav Meir Prem Islam. So the tzaddikim are connected like on a string, and even though they have free will and they're independent, they're so connected to Hashem that they're not, they, don't, they can't choose to do something that goes against the will of Hashem. Um, we have stories of tzaddikim like, I, I think it was the Alter Rebbe, who, when he was, I don't remember, I think it was, oh no, who was it? The Magid, it's written in the Chabad Siddur, HaMelech, one of the big Rebbe's on, on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, when we get to HaMelech, you know, in, in Shachrit, whenever he would leave the davening, he would say that, and he would tremble so much, he would collapse on the floor. Because for him, Hamelech was so real and present that he couldn't handle it. That's like a hint of how tzaddikim perceive the world. Like if you put trade in front of a tzaddik, and then we're not talking about pikuach nefesh, but even with pikuach nefesh, I'm guessing a lot of tzaddikim wouldn't even eat it. They wouldn't. They couldn't choose to eat it because they're so connected to Hashem. For them to eat the treif is, they'd have to be another person. And because they're so connected to Hashem, they're always, it's always clear to them what they need to do, and they're even able to guide other people with the same wisdom that we're trying to learn from Rabbi Nachman. Okay, so I'd like to finish the class. I'm finishing class now at um, 8.45. Yeah, that was my wife's suggestion. That's the same reason I'm wearing a t-shirt. <laughs> Yeah, my wife bought me t-shirts and she said, you're going to wear these now. So I'm practicing wearing t-shirts. And um, I used to come home from the class at 9.15. I'm like, oh, I'm exhausted. She's like, so I'm at 8.45. Okay, so I have to tell a story. And then you can ask a question. Or anyone can ask a question if you want, I guess, after the story. So Mayor Pramishlan, um, it's really fascinating. You know, I have a podcast of Hasidic stories. And... I have 243 episodes. I only realized today when I was finishing editing the episode that I re-recorded a story for the first time, not intentionally, from two and a half years ago. It really annoyed me. Mm. But if I, I have ways of searching and I just didn't search because the war and I wasn't sleeping so well. And, yeah, uh, we're all making mistakes. Right? Yeah, I, I made a similar mistake. It was amazing. Like, 
I just grabbed the first story on the pile that was next to me, of all these piles in my office, and it was a story, I'm telling the story, and then as I'm editing it today, I'm like, wait, I know this story, I told this story already. So the point that I'm making is that I, I have an index of the Rebbe's, and if you go to Reb Meir Premishlan, I think I have almost more stories of him than any other Rebbe, which really surprised me, because before I started this podcast, I hadn't even heard of so much of Reb Meir Premishlan. <laughs> There's many, many stories of him. So, one of the, and there's, there's great stories of some. There's a story, this is a simple story of Reb Meir. Um, in Premishlan, there was a mikveh, it was like a, a, a river, but in order to get there, you had to go over a, a big hill, like a very big hill. And in the, when it wasn't winter, it was fine, but when it froze over, you couldn't go over it. You had to walk around, and walking around took a very long time. So, People tried to go up the hill, they slipped and fall, they slipped and fell because it's ice and snow. But every morning, Reb Mayer, who was already an old man, would simply start walking up the hill, go up the hill, go into the mikveh, come back down the hill, and he never fell. And <clears throat> there were some Hasidim that saw this, and they weren't so impressed. With Reb Mayer, they said, Come on, everybody says that we're going to fall. It couldn't be. But if this old man can do it, then for sure we young guys can do it. And so they see Reb Meir go up, and they start to climb up, and the three of them fall, and they end up breaking arms and legs. And um, afterwards, and I think there's some continuation of it, like they weren't able to stand for the davening and Yom Kippur or something like that. Afterwards, the, when these guys healed, they came to Reb Meir and they said, Mayor, we don't understand. How can you, an old man, climb up this hill and we can't? We're young guys. We're much stronger than you. He said, Ah, what you guys don't understand is Mayor is connected to Hashem with a rope from his mm -hmm. back. Because Mayor is on the level of, of only being connected to Hashem all the time. And when a person is connected to Hashem, they never fall. So when Mayor goes up the hill, Mayor doesn't fall because Hashem carries him up the hill. And Hashem carries him down. And you guys are not on the level, so you fell and broke your bones. So that's the level of the tzaddik. And that's, in a sense, the level that we're trying to tap into with this stage of the lesson, of trying to find the wisdom in everything. But since we're not tzaddikim, we're not connected to Hashem in that way, we have to do it ma'at ma'at, is what he wrote there. Very, very slowly. Just like when the sun starts to come up, there's only a tiny little light. You're only going to have a tiny little light, a tiny bit of light when you start doing this. And don't expect more. But the more you get, then the more you'll perceive. And just to conclude, so we... we um, started the lesson. When we started it, Rabbi Nachman, it was really Rabbi Nassim, brought a story about a guy who came to Rabbi Nachman for advice, and that was the reason that Rabbi Nachman gave this lesson. And Rabbi Nachman's advice to him was to learn Mishnah after davening. And the guy said, he can't, he tried, he doesn't understand anything. And Rabbi Nachman said, it doesn't matter, just read it every day, and eventually you'll start to understand it. And that was the mashal for this lesson. So you might try to hear what Hashem is saying, and you might not hear it, but keep trying to hear it, and eventually you'll hear it. Now, I'm giving you the warning, be very careful not to think that you understand it. It has to be clear to you that that's what Hashem wants from you. How you know, I can't tell you, but you'll have to know yourself. Okay, did anyone want to ask a question before we finish? Yeah, we have a question? No, usually do. In the old days, okay.
شکر خیلی